about how to start a medical billing business without no medical billing or no, no medical or coding background or training. Uh, and we're also going to show you the difference. As you can see there, our subtitle is the difference between medical billing and medical coding. Some people get a little that confused a little bit. So today, that's what we're going to be helping educate you on today. My name is Eric Oje. I'm the Director of Research and Development here at American Business Systems. Today, we're going to be talking about two main areas, the iClaim and the EMRX uh, part, part of everything. And you'll also hear us talk to you about the code right and the audit guard, because it has everything to do with coding. And uh, we're going to explain to you why you don't need a back in medical coding or medical billing to actually do this particular business. Uh, Patrick has been in the entrepreneur business for a long time. Uh, matter of fact, he kind of cut his teeth on the career that he's currently on through a a Apple when Apple was actually here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. But then he kind of got the itching to do some things on his own, so he started several different businesses. And he's, not only has he been able to do that, but he's been an author of the Cash Crunch to Cash Flow book, How to Reprogram Yourself, and soon to come out a new book uh, very specifically on medical billing and some things that the doctors can do to actually help increase their revenue. He's an actually recognized motivational speaker, and he's on the editorial board of the Billing and Coding Advantage magazine. Without further ado, Patrick, you've already joined me here. Good to have you here this afternoon. Let's get started on how to start this medical billing business without uh, any background in this. Yeah, uh, you know, folks, I think people get on these webinars uh, thinking that we're going to try to sell them something. And of course, we we do have a package that is available for people who want to go through our training. But folks, we really don't do a lot of selling on the webinars. What we do is try to uh, educate you and train you as best as we can about our particular business. In other words, we think that the more information you have about the business, the more you'll want to get involved in it. So uh, this one today is a good one because uh, I know the misconception for a lot of people is, oh, I've got to go to some kind of course online or at my local college. I've got to study. I've got to really understand medical billing and the software. And, you know, they think it's much more difficult than it is, and especially the coding part. Right. Yeah. I think the coding part especially kind of just gives everybody a little bump to say, oh, I don't know if I, if I can actually do this. And so hopefully we'll clarify the myth today about, you know, whether you need to know medical billing uh, before you get started. Because uh, as you'll see, Patrick and I will, will educate you on today, is if you try to go in and go to a school to learn medical billing or medical billing, all you come out is you're positioning yourself for a job. What we're talking to you about, and the first thing, Patrick, why don't you talk a little bit about this, is how you're not just getting prepared for a job, but you're really you're going there as a business owner to help yeah, the it's revenue a cycle manager. Different mindset uh, for for people who right. want to go out and just do a job working for a doctor, doing the medical billing and coding. That maybe they do need a lot of background and training, certification of some kind. But folks, when you come through our week long training workshop here in Dallas, we do certify you as what's called a medical revenue manager. And uh, that's much more than just a billing person. Uh, you're able to actually manage the revenue cycle inside of a doctor's office, which has to do with every aspect of the money coming in from the insurance companies, from the government agencies, from the patients, uh, even finding the leaks in the uh, cash flow there in the doctor's office. So uh, your qualifications can be very, very high once you've gone through our training. But you don't need to know about the details of medical billing and coding to get this business started. And like Eric said, that's that's much different than you know working for somebody else. Well, uh, let's first talk about um, you know everybody always wants to know, Patrick, is there a market for this business? And one of the things that we do uh, through our every webinar that we try to to do, we actually try to bring out some current articles showing just the market strategies and the, and the market depth that there is to uh, folks that want to get in this business. Uh, Adam actually found this article and sent this both to us to this afternoon. Uh, very interesting article. I've got the post down there right at the very, very bottom, folks, so if you can see this, this is where you can find that this report. But Patrick, why don't you kind of tell us a little bit what this article is telling us about here. Yeah. By the way, I think Adam just put that link in the chat box inside of this uh, GoToWebinar panel there. So you'll see the link to the actual article there. It just came out. And well, this is basically saying this, that 66% of all the medical providers, that's a term they use for doctors, 
uh, are going to be focusing on improving their revenue cycle management. Now, that's what we train you to do is to, like I said, manage their revenue cycle management. And, and, and so in 2016, 66% of doctors are going to be focusing on that. Folks, that's how you get rich in any industry. You find a need and you fill it. Well, this is showing and proving that there is a need out there for doctors because they wouldn't be focusing on it if it wasn't a, a huge problem inside their office. Patrick, why don't you explain to people that really what we like to talk about, really the difference between just medical billing and what is revenue cycle management? Yeah, the, the revenue cycle management, as you can see here, illustrated by these four different uh, parts of, of the graph, is has to do with the claims preparation itself, of course. That includes the patient registration, uh, the product, the patient eligibility to make sure that they're eligible. That all has to be done by somebody or the patients are going to be seen by the doctor and they're not even eligible, so the doctor doesn't get paid. Very important part. As you'll see when we get into our system here, some screenshots of it today, our system handles that for you. And then, of course, the claim submission is just putting the, the charge entry in for that particular visit, uh, you know, making sure that the, all the things are uh, the way they should be before you transmit it to what's called a clearinghouse. Uh, once the clearinghouse has that, of course, that's a part of making sure that it's uh, exactly, you know, what it needs to be to be paid. And then you have the claims management back on your end, uh, managing the uh, the payment uh, that's uh, being, the, you know, any denials, all that has to be handled. You'll see our system allows you to do all that without knowing a whole lot about uh, all those rules and regulations because we've got it inside of our system. And then the important part for doctors, of course, is the reporting. And that is they want to know where their money is at any particular time. Well, with our system being a cloud-based system, you can give access to the doctor so they can see the status of their claims and their money in real time. There you go. So that's what the whole revenue cycle management, and, and, and if you go into a doctor's office talking in these terms, revenue cycle management. So as Patrick and I talked about today as we begin this, this is part of us educating you right here at the very beginning. Again, if, if you've got to kind of make that mind switch from just being a medical billing company to a, a revenue cycle management company, that really brings in a, a completely different uh, viewpoint to, to those doctors. Now we're going to kind of get into the difference between what, what's the difference between a medical coder versus a medical biller. Um, Patrick, again, we know what a medical coder is because this is the individual that will take the doctor's raw notes if they're going to see you or me or whatever uh, with the doctor and the doctor's writing out all those notes. Those notes have to be translated into some type of numerical medical code. Yeah, uh, everybody probably is kind of aware that there are numerical codes that apply to what's called uh, the diagnosis. In other words, what's wrong with the patient? So there's a number for everything that could possibly be wrong with the human body. Uh, I mean, they're continually coming up with new ones, but there's, a, there's thousands of them. Then there are other codes that the doctor uses when he does a procedure on the patient. For example, right. the exam itself is a, is a procedure code. Uh, maybe he gives a shot. That's another procedure code. All of those are thousands of codes as well. So this is why people think that they need to know those codes to be able to help a doctor. Uh, then, uh, of course, the medical biller is just the person who takes that data from the coder, uh, in this case, from the doctor themselves, for example, in our system, and they translate that into a claim that can be submitted to the insurance company to get paid. So there are differences, but for you, the practical difference is that you don't need to know a whole lot about either one. No, because at the end of our training class, uh, just like what we're showing you right now, uh, everybody will walk away be, becoming a certified medical revenue manager. Patrick, uh, explain to us what this means. Well, it means that you have the uh, ability to say to any doctor or medical provider that you have been trained and certified that you know how to manage their revenue. Uh, and that means, of course, utilizing our cloud-based system to be able to uh, submit those claims to the insurance companies and work with the denials if there are some. There are denials from time to time for all kinds of reasons uh, and be able to get that money. You want to maximize the doctor's revenue. And that's all they really care about, Eric. They just want uh, their money right. and as much of it as they can possibly get for, for what work they did. 
So let's kind of take a look at this in, in some type of pictorial mindset here. Once you are a CRM or CMRM, a Certified Medical Revenue Manager, you are the person that's actually owning the company, but it may be you actually employing a medical biller or maybe a medical coder or a series of these folks. Some of, Patrick, we know that some of our licensees actually have multiple people, multiple billers, people that are just that do just the posting. Some people just do just the the the, the coding. Some people that are just doing just the um, the actually the input of these claims, and um, and that's the difference that positions folks that become a licensee of ours how we actually position them out in the marketplace. Yeah, in other words, folks, if you're just doing the billing for one doctor, you could be all those people. You can do all those functions. It's not going to take that much time to handle the claims for any one particular doctor. But as you grow and as you get referrals, that's how uh, most of our licensees get their, their second and third and fourth clients, is from referrals from the first doctor. And as your business grows, of course, you may have to consider at some point finding someone else who can actually do that uh, that data entry work for you so that you can then become uh, a supervisor, a manager of your business. And you're running the business, not actually doing the business behind the scenes. Believe me, there's lots of people out there that have had training in medical billing and coding that are available to you. Any ad uh, that you put out there on Craigslist, for example, will get you dozens of resumes from those type of people. So it's not hard to find somebody. They can work from their home since it's a cloud-based system and you can oversee and manage that uh, because of the technology that's available nowadays to be able to do that. Before we go any further, let me uh, also remind everybody that the same place that you typed in your city and state is the same place that you can ask Patrick and me questions uh, during the webinar today. So if you have any questions about what we're talking about so far, uh, a medical coder versus a medical biller, what is a certified medical revenue manager, if, if we if we need to bring out some clarification on anything, uh, please simply just type that information in there and we'll we'll get that to you. First of all, we're kind of getting a little technical here, but we want to do that because part of what we want to do and accomplish today is to actually educate you on, you know, what is medical coding. Uh, so basically, the simplest part about it is is taking words and turning them into numbers so that these insurance companies will actually pay the claims to the physician. Patrick, that's one of the roles I believe that's what we see as the clearinghouse because they've got to be formatted just right to get that information to these insurance companies because nobody's at the insurance company is going to read a doctor's note and go, oh, well that's uh, you know a sore throat or a broken toe or anything else. They've got to have it in these codes. Yeah, you can imagine what it would be like if every doctor was just typing in words uh, this person has a sore throat and it looks extra raw on the right side and it also has some, uh, you know, little modules uh, inside of modules. That wouldn't work because uh, nobody could actually ever get a claim paid. But by turning that particular diagnosis into a number that's in a, a book, a catalog, it's, it's all been, uh, you know, already cat categorized, it's easy just to pick that number and that's what the insurance company knows to pay them. Same way with right. the procedure codes, uh, what the doctor did to take care of the patient. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, you could do a lot of different things to a patient, but by turning them into numbers, the insurance company goes, oh, I know exactly what the, the doctor did and how long it took. Right. Matter of fact, that's what we're going to be talking about today, or what Patrick's already mentioned in this. Uh, you have what's called a diagnosis code. Uh, what, and what, what that means is what the medical condition of the patient and then we have what's called the procedure code, what the doctor did to take care of that patient. So as you're taking your little notes today, and as we're, you're learning today, you're learning that there are two parts of the medical code. One is the diagnosis, what's wrong with the patient. Procedure code is what the doctor did to take care of that patient. Actually, we're now looking at something that's becoming kind of archaic to, to some degree. This is what's called a super bill. Patrick, you want to kind of explain what all this is here? I went to the doctor the other day and they handed me one of these at the end. Obviously, it's still being used in doctor's offices, especially if they've not gone completely electronic. But it's, it's a useful tool because the doctor on one page basically can have the codes that he or she uses 
on a regular basis, you know, 99% of the time. So all they do is usually circle the numbers like you see here in this uh, blown up illustration there of, of one. Uh, and that way the people up front know how to bill, uh, you know, for that to the insurance company. In your case, this is passed on to you electronically through our system. Uh, we even have an, uh, an online document management system that can actually let the doctor scan this piece of paper in and it goes into the system, which you then have access to from your computer and you can see those codes from there. Yeah, so this is, uh, like Patrick said, this is still being used today, but today what we're going to show you is a, a much easier way to get the doctor going and plus it shows you your differentiator out there in the marketplace so that in order for you to help you get those clients. So that's part of what we're doing uh, today. Patrick, there's been a lot of talk about ICD-10s and, um, and maybe coming off of ICD-9s. Uh, why don't you take just a moment here to explain what ICD-10 stands for and then what version that we're currently on today. Yeah, you'll hear this term a lot, of course. The, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is a government agency, of course, that oversees all of that, uh, came up with these codes. Uh, they are the International Classification of Diseases, and there has been, uh, you know, versions 1 through 9. We're currently on ICD-10. That came into effect October 1st of last year. And that was the year that uh, basically threw the doctors into a tizzy because it went from like 16,000 codes to over 75,000 codes. So uh, they had to really get uh, you know up to speed on those things if they were not utilizing one of our licensees because, again, our system actually has all those codes in there. Uh, I had those numbers a little off, didn't I? 68,000 no, no, no. now compared to 17,000 yes. codes in there. <laughs> However... Yeah. This October 1st first of this year is another window of opportunity. Eric, it's amazing. It seems like every year there's another great opportunity for our licensees to go in and speak with office managers and doctors about this next date that's coming up. Because this October 1st, Medicare gets serious about those codes. They've been a little lax for the first year uh, on whether they, they were accurate or not. Now, on October 1st, if they're not the exact code the doctors should be submitting, they won't get paid. And that could be a yeah. serious problem for a lot of doctors. Yeah, the best way to understand that is right now they're 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 going to get paid on because they're using the diagnosis codes that fall within the family of that d diagnosis. Now, what they want to get down to is what part of the family, right. you know, and that's what they're getting very serious on. Come this October one, and folks, it presents the doctors a new challenge because this will impact. Guess what? Their cash flow, and that's what that's what we're in business for in the first place to to help uh, eliminate the doctors uh, of not getting paid. That's what we want to eliminate. So we, if you can get on the front end of this, as we're showing here, that it gives you another window of opportunity. And right now we're going to show you that because our system actually passes by the family codes, so to say, and really starts drilling it down. Uh, to this very specific diagnosis, diagnosis codes that actually need to be used. All right, so, so let's talk. Oh, go ahead, Patrick. Well, I was kind of looking ahead there myself, Eric. I, you know, a lot of people don't realize that those, co those codes have to be accurate, or what happens is the insurance company gets that, whether on paper or electronic, and they look at it, and if it's not accurate, they can deny the claim. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, uh, on average, 50% of the denied claims that are sent back to a doctor's office are never resubmitted. Now, folks, that means there are thousands of dollars left on the table that the doctor worked to earn, but he didn't get paid for those uh, claims uh, for a lot of reasons, as illustrated there. There's no time. Uh, there's a lot of chaos in a doctor's office. Everybody's doing 12 different jobs and seeing patients and doing all kinds of stuff. So they don't get to the point where they, they look at those denied claims and go, oh, you know what, I'll just set those aside and maybe someday I'll get to those. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, of course. Uh, that's why 50% of them are never resubmitted. Sometimes they're just not skilled enough. The, the person doing the billing learned from the person ahead of them. Uh, they were trained on the job and they just don't have the skill to know how to work with those denials. And then a lot of it is, of course, a lack of knowledge uh, on how to recode that. 
Well, we've got all that solved with some of our ancillary services that we have for our licensees because we've got over 100 certified medical coders that are ready to assist our licensees and their doctors on making sure those codes are accurate and they get paid the maximum. You know, it's, it, it is, we get a lot of feedback from our licensees, Patrick, and we find out that some doctors have hired a medical biller and over time that medical biller has kind of learned how to do some coding, but that doesn't mean that they're skilled in that. That's why we're talking about there's just no skill. It doesn't mean that somebody doesn't just know that they're ignorant. They just they just lack the skill of a certified professional coder. That's what Patrick's talking about. So we have over a hundred of those for you to use at your disposal. If not, just use the system, and the system uh, certainly will uh, will help with that. We we know the impact of poor coding uh, just absolutely impacts the doctor's revenue. I mean, Patrick, I mean that's again. That's the sole reason that you wrote uh, cash crunch to cash flow. Right. Lost revenue opportunities. Uh, and folks, there's lots and lots of opportunities for a doctor's office to lose revenue simply because their, their people doing the billing just don't know what they're doing. Look, the doctors should not be doing this billing themselves, although many do using their own staff and their own software and so forth. They shouldn't be because that's not their core competency. Eric, they weren't trained on how to do medical billing in, in medical school. They were taught how to take care of uh, people's health. And so right. we have to rely on the fact that the person that they hire either knows what they're doing or they don't. Believe me, a lot of people can fake it and say that they know what they're doing. And hey, if the doctor's getting some checks in each week, then it seems like they do have cash flow, but they've lost a lot of opportunities to collect, again, the maximum amount that they could have uh, collected. So that leads to poor cash flow because the coding is not appropriate. Uh, that, folks, this is why you don't have to know the codes. Our system has the codes built into it, as you'll see again when we show you some screenshots. And we have those certified medical coders that are on staff ready to help you to make sure that the codes are accurate. Uh, and, and Patrick, we've just got to say this. I mean, if people are paying attention here, uh, they, they're going to grasp at least some of the big issues that doctors are facing. So when you when you do launch your business um, in medical billing and hopefully through American Business Systems, you're 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 seeing here that we already pretty much know what some of the problems the doctors are facing. Uh, again, we've been doing this for 22 years, so obviously we've been in the market. We know what's going on. We know what those issues are, and. So these are just some of the big highlights of what's going on and why in the first place a doctor would ever need someone to outsource their billing to. Patrick, I think a lot of people still get so, somewhat afraid of trying to get started in this business because they're afraid that the doctor already has a medical biller on staff. Well, that's right. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but when the doctor outsources their billing, they really are looking for somebody who has the know-how or the resources to be able to help them with that, Cody. Because as we've illustrated here, there's also compliance risks and financial risk for violations. In other words, if the doctor, let's say, is over coding, maybe they saw the, the patient for 10 minutes and they sent a code in that indicates that they uh, visited with them for 30 minutes. That's a violation. Right. HIPAA violation, a Medicare violation, and they will come after the doctor and can fine them $10,000 for every violation. So here's another thing that can impact the doctor's uh, revenue. Yeah, so either either way, whether they undercode is what, we're, what we've defined here, you know, billing for a, a, a level of a visit below what service was provided, uh, they can get dinged for that or, or you know, they, they can get a, a fine for that just as much as they could get a fine for overcoding, as Patrick said, a billing above for what the, the service was actually provided. So well, that's this whole coding point. thing yeah. is, is very important. Good, good point. Uh, undercoding is just as important because let's say the doctor could have billed, really did see the patient for 30 minutes and could have billed at a level five, uh, and instead the person doing the billing bills it at a level three. That means the doctor right. has lost some revenue there because there's a difference in what they can get paid for those two levels. So uh, again, we matter of fact, matter of fact, Medicare looks at that as just as much as as overcoding. 
because you're just you're just not doing what you're what you're what you're talking about. That's right. Uh, we've got you're lying uh, in numbers. <laughs> uh, so as this, as this illustrates, it is the doctor's responsibility though to provide the medical codes to a billing company. Unless you are a quote certified medical biller, like you've gone through a couple of years of training on that and know what you're doing, the doctor. Uh, cannot just tell you to just drop in any code <laughs> and you shouldn't right. do that. You should take exactly what the doctor gives to you either electronically or on one of those forms we saw earlier, the super bill and put in exactly that code that the doctor submitted to you. Now, if the doctor wants you to pass those codes by our certified medical coders, then that's another option that you have and you can make sure that the doctor's codes are correct. But there is a fee of course involved in that for the doctor. Uh, that's something that he would pay Gosh, if you had a certified medical coder in your office, Eric, wouldn't it be a forty thousand dollar a year at least? Oh, plus, yeah, it, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So anybody that has any, uh, that would that would be the beginning, first uh, minimal level. Uh, Brenda's asking a question here. Both both questions are good. Uh, Brenda, you're asking, what if you are a certified coder? Uh, does our cloud-based uh, program is it set up set up to do both coding and billing? And uh, you've you've you're actually on the correct webinar today because that's what we're actually going to show you uh, of what that and uh, because she she goes on to say that I, she wants to offer both coding and billing for her business. So uh, Brenda, we're about to show that to you just in a just in a few few minutes here. Um, let's talk about how you as a medical billing company actually gets the code. So if we know that the, it's the doctor's responsibility. How the world do you actually get those codes? And so there's a couple of ways uh, that can you can actually get the codes, especially if the doctor's doing that super bill. Uh, they can just scan it in and get that to you, uh, or they can go through, like what we have here, an electronic means, which is electronic medical records. Both, are, Patrick, are actually still being used today. Yes. Uh, people are surprised when they go through our training and they get out and actually start looking for their first client. How many doctors are still dealing with paperwork? They have not gone electronic as you would think they all would. I mean, it is the year 2016, right? Uh, but <laughs> doctors are very slow, at least in the billing side of their business, to get involved in the technology that they need to. We just happen to have the latest in technology that allows them to do that completely electronically. Yes. And we can even convert now, the paper electronically. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to really kind of just take us on from the, the life end of a claim here. And we're going to actually start with the patient, as you can see here. And again, illustrate this as best as we can. So we know that uh, someone comes in, they've got a cough. Uh, the doctor's actually going to see them and end up giving that doctor or that patient in their notes what's called the diagnosis code. And... We're actually using the brand new ICD-10 code for a cough, which is an R05. That's the diagnosis code for a cough. So that's so far the uh, the first part of what the doctor is doing. Now we we you can see here that the use of the diagnosis code is for reporting the patient's condition, their signs, and their symptoms all in one. So there could be multiple. Uh, diagnosis codes that actually go along with with uh, for for the doctor seeing the patient. Then, the, once the the doctor sees this patient, then they they've got to actually do something for that patient. Uh, where where it could be like an injection or uh, you know a myriad of different types of things. And that is the next thing that comes along, and that's what's called the procedure code. So there is a what's called a, a level visit, as you can see right there. It's a 99213. That's a visit level. And then what the doctor did, the doctor may have given an injection, which is a 95115. Now, again, this is these numbers are coming from the doctor, but what we're showing you here is that the use of these procedure codes is for reporting, number one, the doctor's time, their evaluation and the management of that illness. Sometimes you might even hear Patrick and I talk about e and m codes or evaluation and management codes. That's what these whole procedure codes are all about right here. And then um, finally, we're going to kind of get down to here. 
uh, again, just putting it in another format for you to get you educated here. And we see that the diagnosis code is basically what's wrong with the patient, which is we see here what's the diagnosis code. And the procedure code is what the doctor did for the patient, which is here is the code. So from here, anybody could actually process this as a medical claim. Patrick, you want to add any more to this before we kind of move on here? If, if uh, you were a medical billing company and you were managing this doctor's revenue, uh, basically what you have right here is all basically you need to process a claim. Yes. Uh, the, the fact is that most people would not have a clue where to begin getting these codes. Again, unless you've been through some sort of course or training on uh, being a medical coder. Now, the reason we say that you don't have to know this, as you'll see illustrated here in a moment, is that the doctor has all those codes built into our system and the system can even assist them in choosing the correct codes. But if you looked at these codes in a manual, we'll just do a Google for, uh, you know, uh, medical codes and you'll see that they come in huge books, you know, this big, great big thick manuals uh, that look, uh, well, I lost my books, but anyway, somewhere I have one of those. Here's one right here. This is what they look like. That's how many codes there are in there. <laughs> yep, huge, huge books and huge codes. But so let's let's jump right on in here, and let's talk about how our system can now be able to handle all of this information and uh, accurately be able to get this information to you in order that you can actually do the billing. And uh, Patrick, this is just where it gets to us just you know a lot of fun here uh, because we're going to get into really you know somewhat of a demonstration of the system before we actually get get going here uh, one little question that we might ask everybody is uh, how many people that are actually on the call have actually actually seen a demo of our system uh, so if you'd like to you can just type in the little questionnaire and say yep I have or if you'd like to see one so you just type in there, yes, I'd like to see a live demo about what you're showing to us uh, right now. Um, but let's kind of step through this. If we had those codes already, we could come right over here. We could go right into the system and click on that we're going to do a professional claim uh, charge right there and then fill in what's called this CMS 1500 form. Before I go any further, Patrick, why don't you, again, help us understand what is CMS? What is 1500? What is all this about? Where did all this begin? Well, CMS is the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Again, a government agency that came up with the codes uh, in conjunction with the American Medical Society uh, and the World Health Organization. So these codes are all standard codes. There's nothing that uh, anybody can uh, make up on their own, of course. They have to go by the codes that are out there. They're used by every medical provider in the entire United States. In fact, uh, in the world, the World Health Organization came up with the, uh, the diagnosis codes. And so those are all pretty uh, standard that are out there. So again, having these codes built into a system like ours, the doctor doesn't have to worry about that because we're going to actually suggest those codes as they use uh, our EMRX uh, system. Yeah, so what we're going to do uh, right now, we're going to kind of step you through on the easeability of how our system will work by taking the codes. Remember we had that diagnosis code, which was a cough, and then we had two other procedure codes, and we're going to actually go through this right now and showing you basically how easy it is just to take those codes and actually process a claim here. So uh, folks, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, jump in there. Boy, it looks like we got a ton of questions that just came in. So uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do to uh, get to those here towards the end. So we're going to try to go through this about another 10 minutes and we'll go through all of your questions here. So you see the next part that we get to here in this whole CMS 1500 form, the first thing we have to fill in is the, the diagnosis codes. Now you can see here that our system has already been set up with an ICD-10 code as well. You can see that all the ICD-10 codes are underneath this patient history right here. So those are the past previous codes. Because folks, remember, the doctors went from 16,000 codes to 68,000 codes plus. They are not remembering all of the codes. That's why we said that uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services have been a little bit laxed on the, just making sure that they're choosing the correct family. But what our system will do, it'll actually drill down into the specifics as we go through this. 
But however, we're going to put in that R05, and when we type that in there, you can automatically see right down at the bottom of the screen down here, it actually listed that word call. That's the diagnosis code. The next thing we're going to need to do is take those other two procedure codes and actually input those into the system here as we go through here. So we we placed that office visit, that 99213, and that 95115, that injection code, and then automatically it populates our fee schedule. Now the fee schedule, to, again, to make this as simple as possible, the fee schedule in and of itself is just the doctor's price list for each of the procedures. So just think of it, you know, if, it, if it's a level three visit, it's $114. If it's a level four visit, it might be a little bit more, maybe $150, $160, but that's based upon the doctor's fee schedules. Then once you're through with that, the next thing that happens here is that we're going to create this claim. Now, again, what makes our system just so better than anybody else's is that not only is this, this claim going to get scrubbed by iClaim, but it's actually going to be going through our clearinghouse simultaneously. And this is another way that we can actually help get those doctors paid uh, much, much quicker. Let me just touch on uh, clearing houses. We've mentioned that a couple of times. And for some people, that may be a little confusing. But folks, there, uh, there are third-party institutions that are set up that can actually take the data from all the different systems that are out there electronically and look at those claims electronically and do some scrubbing, making sure that the claims are correct. That's called a clearinghouse. The clearinghouse then reformats that the way the insurance companies want to see it. They all want to see it a little differently, and it forwards that on electronically. So that clearinghouse function is very important. Now, you could send it individually to every one of the insurance companies that are out there, but it would be a real headache to do that kind of thing. We've had people try that, and they've gone, you know what, I'll pay the you know, 50 cents per claim or whatever it is to have this looked at by the clearinghouse. However, uh, in our system, it's very unique in that we also have not just the billing system and the electronic health record system, we also have the clearinghouse built into our system, so there is no submitting of those claims to a third party. It stays within our system. This is why we can guarantee, well, it's not a guarantee, it's just a nationwide average, less than 2% of all of our claims ever get denied. So that's because we have our own clearinghouse and can control that ourselves. Very important uh, to make sure that the doctor maximize their revenue. Eric, let me, let me point out that one of the reasons that people might want to see a live demo is not just to see all the benefits and the bells and whistles of our system, of course, because it is the latest technology that's out there. However, we also do live demos for your prospective doctors. So we have a way of you scheduling those demos with doctors so that they can see the features that we're going to be showing you. So you'll actually be watching a demo that's similar to what we'll be doing for your doctors. You'll get a preview of the help that we give you in selling the doctor on the system. Yeah, for you. Uh, Patrick, part of as we kind of wrap up today, again, we've kind of been talking about the medical coding and the medical billing, and I think we kind of got that down pretty well. But uh, the two that I want to talk to you is the audit guard and the, and the code right, both of those services that we have there on the left and the right top here. Um, you've already mentioned to us that we've, we've got over 100 plus coders here. Uh, tell us real quickly about what both of these services do because they're actually utilizing the same certified professional coders. Yeah, the, the great thing about some of our uh, services, folks, is because you can use these to actually get in to speak with the doctor when they may not, they may think that their billing is under control. You know, they're either they're doing it themselves or maybe they've already outsourced it to someone else. So how is it that our licensees are signing up doctors all over the country every day from coast to coast? It's because we have ways to get in to speak to the doctor and the office manager about other services that they will be interested in, even if they are not interested in outsourcing their billing. So that's the purpose of these services. And as Eric mentioned, the audit guard uh, and the uh, the uh, uh, code right are both services that are you know, we have certified medical coders that will look at the doctor's codes and make sure that they're correct. This is the code right service. It's provided to you by our uh, certified coders and that you can pass that on to the doctor if they're interested in making sure their codes are, are accurate and, and increasing their revenue by up to 30 percent. 
the uh, yeah. the audit guard, of course, is similar to that, uh, but it's looking for violations of those codes and can provide wonderful reports, uh, almost like an insurance policy for the doctor in case they are met, uh, audited by Medicare. But those motor, those coders are doing that code right service for you, for the doctors, uh, making sure that those codes are exactly what they need to be so that the doctor doesn't get it. Yeah, we can see here on your uh your marketing flyer that you get, you're going to get uh, on all the auxiliary services and the iClaim and the EMRX, you're going to get over 2,000 pieces of marketing uh, pieces and slips like we're, we're showing you right here. And here's the one blown up a little bit bigger for you so you can see here. And we've got bulleted pointed out on the right hand side. And you can see on average there could be a, up to a 15% improvement automatically. Uh, there's that stop underbilling because what we see a lot of times is that doctors are afraid to bill and so instead of billing that level four visit they may be billing a level three visit because they're afraid to be audited as Patrick just mentioned and so this is this is where a lot of doctors are, are leaving money on the table not necessarily intentionally but because they're afraid to get audited so you know, to get the proper codes, that's that's the real way to go about it. Uh, you know, let, let's address that just for a second. People have heard that term HIPAA. Uh, every time you go to the doctor, you sign some kind of form that says you are agreeing that uh, they follow all the rules and regulations for HIPAA. And uh, that's the Health Insurance uh, Portability uh, Act that, that basically the government passed to make sure that the patient data is protected. So Brandon's asking if there's things in place that make sure that HIPAA violations aren't uh, you know, made in our system. The answer is our system is HIPAA compliant, Brandon, but that doesn't mean that you or the doctor's staff even could, could make some uh, mistakes in violating HIPAA. You have to know what those HIPAA rules and regulations are. And of course, in our training, we point you to ways to uh, learn about that. But the point is that uh, if, if the system that you're using is HIPAA compliant, then everything you do in the system, of course, is compliant as well. Exactly. I do see, uh, let's see, I'm kind of going back up as you were doing, going through there. I, I think we missed one up here at the top, and I believe, uh, oh, this is from Meredith. And Meredith, you asked the question, uh, you say, in our area has individual medical practices, uh, uh, there are medical billing practices that are being bought up by large big box medicine. Uh, big, big box med is the way of the future under the Affordable Care Act. How does ABS deal with this uh, in the future? <laughs> well, we're, we've dealt with it for the past uh, couple of years, actually. Uh, it's true that there are doctors who are being bought up by the insurance, uh, I mean, the big uh, health groups and by hospitals. But what they don't realize is that they're actually just getting a job, right? They become an employee. They work the hours that the hospital says they must work. They get paid only what the hospital thinks they're worth. They take off only when the hospital says they can, and they see as many patients as the hospital says they have to see. So a lot of doctors are now moving back from that after their you know one or two year contract is up with the hospital, they're going back into private practice. What they don't realize is they gave up all their patients to the hospital when they, when they sold out to the hospital. But they're willing to, there's doctors who are actually willing to start all over from scratch because they miss that independence uh, that's why they got into private practice to begin with. So even though there are doctors uh, being absorbed by those groups, there are also doctors coming back into the private practice. And there's thousands of them that are out there that have never even considered doing that. It would never do that, no matter what kind of offer was made. Okay, yes. now the guarantee. Okay. This yeah, is now uh, pretty unusual. Guarantee. When we came up with this, a lot of people didn't understand why we could do this. It's because we know what we have, folks, and people who go through the training, if you'll watch some of the testimonials out there on our website blog, you'll see that they are you know, more than thrilled when they go through the training and what it can do for you. But because we can't tell you everything that you need to know before you make that commitment and pay our licensing fee, uh, which is $24,990, somebody asked that question, uh, before you pay that fee, you come down to training and you sit through that classroom. And if for any reason at the end of that workshop, you don't think this is right for you, any reason whatsoever, you know, you just don't like uh, the way Eric uh, combs his hair, for example, you just <laughs> simply tell any staff member and they will arrange for you to receive a full refund of your license fee. Folks, we give you back every penny of that. We have done that. 
we have done that in, in our past. Remember, we've been in business for 22 years, but you know, a handful of people right. have asked for money back. We don't care about that because we make our money on the back end uh, as the claims go through our system. So uh, the point is, folks, that it's a risk-free investment. All you're investing is your time and the cost that it gets uh, takes to get here uh, and stay at the hotel for a week. Maybe a thousand dollars. It's it's a very small investment to find out if what we say is real. Mm.